When I was growing up, my family didn't have a dog. Other kids in the neighborhood had a dog. So one day I asked my dad, why don't we have a dog? And my dad said, because they used hunts on us. Meaning that the Nazis used dogs to attack and intimidate my family, my dad and my grandmother, during the three years that they spent in Nazi concentration camps. We also didn't have a German car, no Volkswagen, no Mercedes, no BMW. Nazi cars is what my dad called them. Last summer, I was standing at the Hertz rental car counter in Berlin when the clerk said to me, Mr. Rosen, I'm very sorry, we don't have the car that you reserved. And my face kind of fell. And the clerk said, but don't worry, Mr. Rosen, I have really good news for you. Uh, I've got a car that has a sunroof, and it's leather, and it's big. It's a wonderful luxury car. Mr. Rosen, let me show you the beautiful Mercedes-Benz that we have for you. And I thought, this is going to be kind of an interesting road trip where I'm going to be taking this car. I'll tell you where I took this car uh, at the end of this talk. Let me first tell you why I went to Germany to begin with and what I learned there. Last summer, I went to Germany with uh, 20 other people from the United States, a pretty distinguished group, a governor, another district attorney, uh, several prominent academics, conservative activists, progressive activists, uh, the head of a nonprofit association, a few reporters, uh, 60 Minutes, uh, the television news program, and a convicted murderer from Detroit. One big happy family. <laughs> Germany has a very low crime rate and a very low incarceration rate, meaning a very low percentage of their citizens who are in prisons. By contrast, the United States murder rate is six time, pardon me, is nine times as high as in Germany, and we incarcerate 10 times at the rate of 10 times as many as they do in Germany. In the United States, we'll spend more than $50 billion a year on prisons, more than $9 billion a year alone in California. In fact, California is one of 16 states where there are more people in prison than there are in college. It costs about $50,000 a year to house someone in prison. For those of you that are seniors, you know that the cost of going to a university, all in cost, can be something like $50,000 a year, or maybe even more than that. Now, I know everybody here is going to graduate, but uh, Six out of 100 American men who graduate from high school, but not college, will spend a year in prison before they turn 30. For high school dropouts, 28 out of 100 will spend a year in prison before they turn 30. For African American men who drop out of high school, 68%, 68 out of 100, will spend a year in prison before they turn 30. However, it was not always this way in the United States. This is our incarceration rate from 1925 to about 1975. An incarceration rate is a, a fancy word for saying, what's the percentage of our residents who are either in jail or prison? And you'll see that from 1925 to 1975, that 50 year period, it's about 100 per 100,000 and it's pretty stable. It goes up a little bit in around 1940, comes down a little bit, but it's very stable. But then something quite dramatic happens from the mid-1970s until today. And you'll see, from the mid-1970s until today, the incarceration rate shoots up to where it is today at around 700 per 100,000, a seven-fold 
700% increase. Now, to put this in context a little bit, what about other countries, right? Well, when we compare ourselves to other democracies, to other first world democratic nations, our incarceration rate is off the chart, as you can see. Uh, we're by far the highest. Uh, every other country in Europe, uh, including Australia, Canada, is much, much lower than ours. Um, and as you see, Germany, uh, almost maybe a tenth, little nine times fewer people incarcerated than in our country. So uh, there was a study done by the National Academy of Sciences in 2014, and they concluded that the growth in the incarceration rate in our country over the last 40 years is historically unprecedented and internationally unique. Now, it's historically unprecedented because look what we were for 50 years. So it's unprecedented for ourselves. This is not the way we've done things in this country. But it's also internationally unique. When we compare ourselves to other countries, we're incarcerating far, far more uh, individuals than they are. Now, it turns out that even as the incarceration rate in our country increased and increased and increased, crime fell and fell and fell. Now, some people will say, oh, well, the reason that crime fell and fell and fell is because our incarceration rates rose and rose and rose. See, and the, the argument is simple. The reason crime went down is we got tough, and we sent more people to prison, we made the prisons harsher, we made the prison sentences longer, we didn't let people out on parole, and that taught people, and that's why crime went down. That's a pretty simple and straightforward argument, kind of appeals to a Wild West sort of mentality. And remember, uh, when you're trying to persuade people of something, a simple argument, something that people can understand, uh, kind of gets you halfway there towards persuading them. People can understand something, they're more likely to agree with it than if they don't understand it. Now the problem with this argument, and there's only one, you know, sort of very small problem with this idea, is it's completely wrong. Uh, and the way that we know this is it turns out that crime doesn't just uh, have sort of trends in cities or countries, but across the Western world, across the developed world, Europe, Australia, Canada, it turns out that crime has moved in parallel since the Middle Ages. And we know this from all kinds of records uh, that we have uncovered. And it turns out that from the kind of mid-19th century until the 1950s, 1960s, crime fell throughout cities around the world. And then from the 1960s to the early 1990s, crime rose, property crime, violent crime, rose all over the Western world. But then beginning in the early 1990s until today, crime fell all throughout Europe, Australia, Canada, the United States. It fell in all of those places. Now, let's take a look at our neighbor to the north, Canada. The reason I like to use Canada as an example, but I could do this with any country in Europe, is right, we share a border with Canada. Uh, right, we think Canadians are sort of like us, uh, except nicer, a little bit nicer. I think that's the stereotype of Canadians. So uh, if you look here, these are a comparison of robbery rates uh, in the United States and in Canada. And you'll notice uh, that the rates kind of tick up in the early 1990s in both countries and then begin to fall to rates that weren't seen in either country till the 1960s. So crime robbery fell in both countries. The same with homicide. Our rate is on top. We have more robberies, we have more homicides. The Canadian rate is underneath. But you'll see the same kind of pattern. Again, in the early 1990s, there's sort of an uptick in murder. That's what homicide is, a kind of uh, murder. And then from the 1990s, in both countries, it falls back to levels not seen since the 1950s or 1960s, right? So in other words, in the United States and Canada, crime was rising in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and early 90s. In both countries, crime went up. And then crime started to fall in both countries. Okay, well, why did the crime fall? Well, 
if in the United States you say it fell because you see we got tough and we put a lot more people in prison, well, what did Canada do in terms of its incarceration rate? Here's what we did, right? Our incarceration rate's on top. We responded by throwing a lot more people in prison for a lot longer. Our crime rate goes way, our incarceration rate goes way up. What did Canada do? Nothing. The same thing that they'd been doing for the last hundred years. And what's interesting about Canada is their incarceration rate of about 100 per 100,000 people. Wait a minute, where have we heard that before? That's what our incarceration rate was from, the from 1925 until 1975. And so it turns out that uh, what affects crime rates is a lot more than just how many people that you put in prison. Uh, New York University Law School a couple years ago came out with a very documented uh, extensive study and they found that uh, increasing in car they found three things. Number one, increasing incarceration rates, throwing more people in prison for longer, will have a negligible effect on crime. Number two, uh, better policing, including the use of data to target police resources, has played a significant role in the drop in crime. And number three, certain socioeconomic factors have played a large part in reducing crime, and those factors are uh, an aging population, smaller families, uh, and decreased alcohol consumption. So let's sort of move from a little bit to, from a lot about statistics and policies to what I saw in Germany. Now, German prisons are very different than American prisons. Number one, they're a lot smaller. The largest prison in Germany is Tegel Prison in Berlin. It has 1,200 inmates. Most German prisons are much smaller. They have 300 to 500 inmates in them. By contrast, American prisons, very large. The largest, Rikers Island in New York, over 14,000 inmates. Uh, Angola State Prison in Louisiana, more than 5,000 inmates. California, if you drive an hour and a half north to San Quentin, 3,500 inmates. If you drive an hour and a half south to Soledad State Prison, 3,600 inmates. Much, much larger. Secondly, German prisoners wear their own clothes. They dress just like you do. They cook their own meals, and they have tremendous freedom of movement within the prison. By contrast, American prisoners, right, we all know they wear identical uniforms. They're confined in their cells for most of the day, and they eat meals in these large uh, cafeterias. Uh, German prisoners have uh, their own cell, uh, telephone in it, uh, and uh, their own kind of toilet as well. And let's look a little bit at Heidering Prison. This is the most recently built prison in Germany. It was built in 2013. So you see from the outside, right, barbed wire. Well, it looks like a prison. Um, this is a, an entryway into it. This is just a place where everybody can walk through the prison to get from one place to another. You see there's a lot of natural light. There's kind of a sense of design and style. And the photos I'm showing you are exactly what the prison looked like when we saw it last summer. So if the photos, if you think that, oh gosh, it looks immaculate, it looks cleaner than, than this high school, uh, th that's, this is how it looks, there, exactly how we saw it. Again, a lot of, a lot of light, a, a lot of natural light, a lot of glass that comes in. Uh, this is, you'll see, uh, this is looking into the, the dormitories where individuals live. And, Right, there's kind of a, a balcony on each floor, a couple balconies for inmates to go and get a little bit of fresh air. Right? The only difference is, yes, there's bars there so someone doesn't uh, try to jump or try to escape. Uh, but it's very pleasant. There's a lot of grass and it's a, it's a feeling that's more akin to being, frankly, on a, a junior college campus uh, than it is to being uh, in a prison. So I'm gonna take you, this is a, a hallway and the doors on either side are where the cells are. So we're going to take you into a cell in, in uh, just a moment here. So this is what uh, a typical cell looks like. It's not very large, uh, about 100 square feet. I mean, they told us that in you know, this thing called the metric system, which 
Americans don't understand, but it's about 100 square feet. And you'll see uh, there's a little, uh, there'll be a, there would be a mattress over on the side there, a small mattress. There's a desk, there's a telephone, there's a, a window for natural light, and there's also an area, there's a little partition where there's a, a toilet and a sink. Now, President Obama visited a federal state prison uh, last summer. He went to El Reno Federal State Prison in Oklahoma, and he saw prison cells there that were about this size, the difference being in those cells two or three inmates would live, whereas in Germany there's only one. There's a lot less violence in German prisons than in American prisons, and part of that is because individuals are living in their own cell. Now, for some of you that are going to college next year, the size of this cell is very much the same size as the dormitory that I lived in when I went to UCLA. Uh, maybe the, the room I had, the dorm room I had was a little bit larger, but there were two of us in it. But there's a big difference between kind of two college students, maybe one who's a little bit too clean and one who's too messy, and having a rapist and a murderer sharing uh, a cell this size, right? Think about that. So uh, now this is, there's little cafeteria areas on each of the floors, and there's a little kitchen here, and we asked the German prison officials in that kitchen, are there, are there knives, are there pots and pans, you know, are there dangerous and deadly weapons from the American perspective? And the German correctional officer said, well, of course, I mean, that's what you would cook with. So much different uh, view about what inmates should have. The German view is trying to have people live in prison the way they're going to live when they're outside of prison. They're going to need to cook their own meals and know how to do that. So let's have them do that here. And this is just another view of that. Now, very interesting things about German prisons. Every year, if an, an inmate in prison is doing mental health counseling, you know, going to the classes they're supposed to go to, doing vocational training, doing all the things they're supposed to do in prison, they're allowed to leave the prison for a few hours or even overnight regardless of the crime they have committed. And every year, there are hundreds of thousands of prison visits, pr prison leaves, what we might call furloughs. And out of those hundreds of thousands of leaves, we asked, well, how many times does an inmate not come back? How many times do they, not commit, a, do they commit a crime when they're out? And the answer, out of all of those leaves each year, 0.3% of inmates either don't come back or commit a crime while they're out. That's three in a thousand. We don't have anything like that in the United States. German prisons, there are four kinds. They don't call them minimum, medium, maximum security. They think that calling a facility maximum security will lead to violence between the inmates and between the inmates and the staff. Like everybody's gotta be tough because they're going to maximum security. So the they have facilities where inmates are serving sentences of five years or longer, facilities where they're serving sentences of five years or fewer, juvenile facilities. So if you commit a crime when you're 18 years or younger, you would go to a juvenile facility and you would do pretty much your whole sentence there. So most of the people in the juvenile facilities are actually in their early to mid 20s, but the Germans want to try to segregate younger offenders away from older, more hardened criminals, so as not to have these younger offenders become more hardened criminals. And number four, they have something called open prisons. An open prison is where you go when you have six months or less remaining on your sentence. And at that facility, you're encouraged to leave during the day and look for a job and look for housing, and you just have to come back there at night. The people that work in German prisons uh, are much different than the people that work in American prisons. It's very difficult to get a job as a German correctional officer. Fewer than 10% of the applicants uh, are accepted. And it's like getting into UCLA or Berkeley or something like that to get a job like this. Uh, their training, they have two years of training. Most of their training is in social work, counseling, rehabilitation. Some of it is in 
physical control kinds of techniques. Uh, the facilities, as I've shown you, this hydrine prison, the German prisons, they're very nice places to work. They're clean, the staff eats the same food as the inmates, and the atmosphere in the prisons is actually quite relaxed. It's not tense and, and angry. Now the obvious question is why? Article 1 of the German Constitution. Human dignity shall be inviolable. To respect and protect it shall be the duty of all state authority. That's the very, the number one most important thing uh, in the German Constitution. And that's been cited by the German Supreme Court to give inmates one person per cell, no solitary confinement, no death penalty, uh, and everyone's eligible for parole there. Now, of course, this German constitution uh, didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, I wanted to show you the picture of Shaka Senghor. He was the uh, convicted murderer from Detroit who came on this trip with us. He's been released. He's doing very well. Uh, he spent seven and a half years in solitary confinement in a Michigan state prison. Uh, the German officials think that this is uh, cruel and almost torture, and we're surprised that he's not completely insane. Now, I said to you uh, that I showed you the German Constitution. That Constitution in Germany was written in 1949, while Germany was occupied by the United States, Britain, and France after World War II. That was written in the shadow of the Holocaust and what the German government had done. And so it's not a surprise that the number one thing was respect human dignity. Now, finished my week-long trip there, got in the Mercedes-Benz, and started to drive to Bergen-Belsen. The car started to speak to me in German and give me directions. I don't speak German, and I wasn't real comfortable being told what to do in German, uh, particularly given the fact that I was going to Bergen-Belsen. I arrived at Bergen-Belsen about three hours later. Uh, my father and grandmother were in Bergen-Belsen from January 1945 until April 15, 1945. Uh, this was their third concentration camp. Uh, they'd been in two other slave labor camps in Poland. By the time they got to Bergen-Belsen in 1945, there were 60,000 people and 10,000 corpses, that's dead people, uh, in an area less than 0.2 square miles, less than half the size of your campus here. So there wasn't a need for uh, people to shoot to kill people. Uh, disease like typhus and typhoid killed thousands of people. Even after the camp was liberated in April of 1945 by the British, another 10,000 people died the next month. Uh, in March of 1945, at the same time, my, my family, my dad, my grandmother were there. Uh, Anne Frank and her sister Margo, you may have heard of her, uh, died in March of 1945. Uh, so I, I got to the camp. Uh, these are some photos of what the camp looked like. It was burned to the ground by the British to get rid of all the disease that was there. And so there's sort of a memorial that's been set up on the site. I met with Dr. Bernd Horseman. Uh, he's the chief archivist at Bergen-Belsen, and I had corresponded with him before I came. He's about my age. He's not Jewish. He grew up near this camp, uh, and I sent him the information about my family. I spent the, about half the day with him and half the day walking around, and he was actually able to show me the records from the, that the British Army kept and the Jewish Committee kept of the people that had survived. Um, the name of the Jewish Committee's records is called Shari Taplata which uh, is often translated as uh, uh, Holocaust survivors or something like that. But the Hebrew is much more poignant. It means counted remnant. And in the records, I saw the original names of my, my dad and my grandmother, my remnants. I walked around the camp for about four hours. Uh, there's mounds like this all over the camp, where there's tens of thousands of people that are uh, buried underneath there. I didn't go to Germany to forgive or forget, and I didn't either, but I went to learn. How did a country that had done such horrible things recreate itself so quickly into one of the most enlightened when it comes to crime and punishment? 
If Dostoevsky was correct when he said the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons, then how civilized are we? What I learned from visiting gleaming prisons, talking to correctional officers and convicted criminals, and in walking through a quiet field of mass graves, is that the world might be broken but it can be repaired because we're all created with human dignity. Thank you. <laughs>